Good afternoon. I'm Jerry Ford, representing the 5th Congressional District, which comprises Kenton, Ottawa County. And it's a privilege and a pleasure for my colleague Bob Griffin, who represents the 9th Congressional District, which runs from Muskegon to Traverse City, and I to have this program and to talk with you a few minutes this afternoon. This afternoon, the first part of the program, we would like to uh, discuss uh, for you and with you uh, a very controversial program that was submitted a year or so ago in the Senate of the United States involving the national park better known as Sleeping Bear. I think it is uh, recognized that the bill which was introduced in the Senate about a year or two ago uh, was a bill that was unrealistic and was greatly in need of improvement. Now, Congressman Bob Griffin, who represents the area which is directly affected, is a very competent authority on this whole area. And as a consequence, uh, I think it might be very helpful for all of us if Bob Griffin would take a few minutes to explain in some detail his new program, which is set forth in uh, House Bill 2400, which Bob recently introduced in the House of Representatives so that we can get the alternatives between what was proposed uh, about a year or two ago and what is now before the House of Representatives. Bob, it would be very helpful if you could give us some background on this uh, issue and your proposed solution. Well, Jerry, I'll start off the discussion here, and uh, I hope you will break in with some of the questions that uh, uh, covering areas that I may not touch upon. First of all, I think it might be well to uh, look at this map behind us, and uh, <clears throat> for those uh, who have never been up in this beautiful region, uh, up in Leelanau and uh, Benzie County, to just see where the Sleeping Bear region is. Uh, with relation to the whole of the state of Michigan. And, of course, it's right up in, in this area here. And the uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes are over along the uh, shore of Lake Michigan, uh, up off of the uh, shore here. You can see South Manitou and North Manitou Islands, which are the two cubs uh, which the Sleeping Bear is waiting to swim to shore. This is the story or, or the tale of the Sleeping Bear. The, the uh, dunes, of course, uh, represent the, the mother bear. And it's a beautiful country. Most people are quite familiar with it. Bob, how many um, acres are involved in your bill in comparison to one or more of the alternatives? And uh, are enough acres in your bill uh, for the real development of the park for the next 10, 20, or 30 years? Well, Jerry, the uh, bill introduced uh, earlier in the Senate which was so controversial, included some 77,000 acres of land in that area. And here this map indicates, with the uh, light uh, colored areas, the, er the, the, the extent of that uh, proposal. Now the Sleeping Bear Dunes are along in here. <coughs> and the uh, sponsors of the bill and the uh, Secretary of Udall and the Department of uh, Interior indicated that their principal purpose was to preserve the Sleeping Bear Dunes and also uh, uh, undeveloped Lake Michigan shoreline. But it will be noted that uh, the earlier Senate bill not only included the Sleeping Bear Dunes and Lake Michigan shoreline, but went inland a great distance and included some highly developed, expensive inland lake areas. Now, the bill that I have introduced, H.R. 2400, in this session of Congress, uh, includes uh, some 34,000 acres instead of 77,000. And uh, it, that area is indicated here by the checkered uh, 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 marks. And you will see that it includes only the Lake Michigan shoreline area, it does not go inland or include the inland lake areas, but it does include North Manitou Island, which was left out of the earlier Senate proposal. The earlier proposal did include South Manitou Island, one of the, the, the Sleeping Bears Cubs, but strangely, and for no reason that anybody's been able to explain, left out the North Manitou Island. Here is an undeveloped region which uh, has great potential for 
future development for camping and recreational purposes, a lot of Lake Michigan shoreline, and if you're going to have one island, and so you're going to have to have a ferry uh, or some means of transportation to take people back and forth, why not take the other island now while it can be acquired very at a very low cost to the taxpayers and look here for the uh, development of recreational areas rather than go inland where this has already been built up and provides a solid tax base for local governments and school districts. Bob, uh, one of the most controversial features of the bill that was introduced in the Senate uh, several years ago was the uh, method of condemnation and the extreme powers that were given to the uh, federal government for the taking of land of people uh, in the area that was involved. Could you tell us, is there any change in your bill in this very important yes, feature? Yes, I, I think that, uh, of course, we all recognize that there are times when for the public good and if it's necessary, uh, private property must be condemned for public use and purpose. I think the question that arises is, when is this necessary, and to what extent is it necessary? And when you try to uh, answer this question, you, I think, should look at how much public, uh, how much land is already in public ownership and is available for development for park purposes. In Michigan, incidentally, if, if you'll ever take the trouble to look at the uh, official state highway map put out by Commissioner John Mackey, where it indicates the uh, extent of federally owned land and state owned land in the state of Michigan, uh, any of you can reach in your glove compartment and take a look at that map sometime. You'll be amazed, I believe, at how much of the state of Michigan is already publicly owned. Now then, the powers of the secretary to condemn land under the prior bill, in my opinion, were much too broad and extreme and included this highly developed inland lake area which is not necessary for uh, an adequate development of recreational uh, uh, land. Now, in the bill that I have introduced, <coughs> we have uh, not only left this uh, inland lake area out of, the, uh, out of the bill, but even those developed areas within the park, Jerry, are not subject to condemnation. There are some 90 developed uh, properties within the area that I have proposed. Of course, it's a question of how can you benefit the, the most people and do the least damage to the fewest. Now, it's impossible to develop a park without including some developed property. But as against 90 uh, private homes in this area, there are 1,600 in this other area. So my bill includes less than 6%. Now, instead of allowing the condemnation of these private properties in here, we provide only that the federal government can take an option to purchase the property. They have to pay the owner for that option. But if and when the owner ever decides voluntarily to sell his property, then he must give a first right of purchase to the federal government. And also he must uh, uh, execute and put on uh, the uh, records an easement, a scenic easement, whereby he undertakes, and he's paid for this, he undertakes to maintain and preserve the character and the condition of his property, not to use it for a commercial purpose. But except for that, there is no, uh, only the undeveloped property is subject to condemnation within the, con the limits of my bill. Bob, uh, as a member of the Committee on Appropriation, uh, I'm naturally interested in how much uh, this whole program will cost the taxpayers. My committee has to put the money sure. up to uh, buy the land and to develop the area. Uh, can you give us some cost comparisons between the bill which was introduced in the Senate to encompass this whole area and your alternative bill which has the sleeping bear in it and practically all of the waterfront? What is the cost differential? Well, the, the best estimates that uh, we've been able to get from competent authorities and going on the basis of uh, valuations uh, in the area are that the acquisition cost of this larger 77,000 uh, acre uh, proposal would be in the neighborhood of uh, 12 to 16 million dollars. Now, this proposal, which I have uh, advocated, 34,000 acres and mostly undeveloped property, would involve an acquisition cost of only two to three million dollars. So you can see there is a tremendous saving to the taxpayer uh, using this uh, proposal that I've advanced. 
Obviously, it's because uh, this is largely undeveloped property and uh, doesn't include the highly uh, expensive developed uh, areas. And Jerry, while we're talking about that, I think it's uh, very important for people to keep in mind that when the federal government, or the state government for that matter, uh, uh, acquires title to land, it goes off the tax rolls and it no longer is subject to taxation for the support of local uh, units of government, like school districts. Um, in the bill that I have uh, proposed, uh, the federal government would make payments in lieu of taxes to the local school districts and local municipalities if they have bonded indebtedness, uh, so long as the bonded indebtedness remains on the books. In other words, if uh, at the present time, for example, the Glen Lake Community School District has an outstanding bonded indebtedness of a half a million dollars running over a 26-year period. Well, nearly 55% of their assessed valuation, uh, Jerry, would be included within the proposal introduced in the Senate, if you could imagine. Now, if that were to be taken off the tax rolls, all of the burden of paying that bond issue would be left on the people the other 45 percent. Well, first of all, I think that's uh, entirely unreasonable to include that much, but secondly, even under my proposal, uh, I, I believe that the federal government, if they're going to take property off the tax roll, not only should pay the fair market value of it, but like uh, they should be substituted for a taxpayer who would continue to pay taxes, at least what, uh, during the period that an outstanding bond indebtedness has been, uh, remains unpaid. Bob, what do you think the prospects are for the enactment of some legislation in this Congress for the establishment of a Sleeping Bear uh, National Park in this area? Well, Jerry, that's a question I wish I could answer. I think a lot of it is going to depend upon the Department of Interior and the sponsors of the other legislation, which uh, was introduced earlier. Now, I think that... Uh, I have demonstrated, and I, I believe I, I, I represent the views of most of the people of my area, and that is that they believe in the development of parks, and they would like to cooperate with a reasonable national park. If the uh, sponsors of the other legislation in the Department of Interior will see fit to support proposals along this line, I think we'll have a national park, Jerry. But if we don't have a national park, I think the blame is going to have to be borne by the people who are insisting upon what I consider to be an unreasonable proposal. And incidentally, let me uh, put in some uh, a, a fact that's, I think, rather significant. When the Sleeping Bear area first came to national attention as a possible national park, this was in 1959 when Secretary of Interior Fred Seaton announced the results of a study that had been made by a presidential advisory commission. And he announced in 1959 that there were some 30,000 acres along Lake Michigan shore in the area of the Sleeping Bear that would be of national significance for a, for a national park. Now then a little bit uh, later, Congressman John Dingell, a Democrat of uh, Detroit, introduced a bill calling for the establishment of a 26,000 acre national park. Now, so my proposal is right in line with the original recommendation of the Department of Interior and with the original proposal of Congressman John Dingell. And why it has suddenly been expanded to more than twice the original proposal is something that our people uh, in, in our area, of course, just can't understand. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for analyzing uh, the sleeping bear problem and for explaining your proposal and comparing it with the rather unreasonable an unrealistic proposal that was introduced in the Senate uh, in the past. I think it's vitally important for all of our listeners and the people of the state of Michigan to know the facts about this very controversial but very important uh, issue that the Congress will face in the next uh, two years. Now, Boo, before we close off this part of the program, I want to thank Bob, but also tell you that in the next part of this program, we will discuss the federal uh, budget to some extent, but more importantly, our national defense program, its ramifications and implications. Thank you. In this second segment of our program this afternoon, we're going to turn from the sleeping bear issue, which has some national interest and uh, a great deal of state and local interest to a 
subject which, uh, without any question, has a great broad national interest. And that's our defense budget. About 50 cents or more of every tax dollar that you send to Washington goes to support the Defense Department and our defense establishment. And Jerry Ford of Michigan, as uh, most of you I'm sure know, is a very key person on the House Appropriations Committee. But more important, he's the senior or ranking Republican on the subcommittee on appropriations for the Defense Department, which uh, and the 12 members of that subcommittee, in which he's the senior ranking member, uh, has jurisdiction over half of the federal budget. Well, Jerry, I'm sure that our viewers today would be interested in knowing something about how your subcommittee is organized and how you go about spending uh, $50 billion or more. Well, Bob, uh, let me give you a little background on the subcommittee as well as the Committee on Appropriation. You indicated that uh, there are 50 members on the total Committee on Appropriation. Uh, this committee is broken up into 13 subcommittees, one for the Department of Agriculture, one for the Departments of State Justice and the Judiciary. Uh, my most important uh, assignment is on the Defense Subcommittee, and we have 12 members. We have seven Democrats, and we have five Republicans. And this subcommittee uh, of 12 starts hearings early in January uh, to analyze the president's defense budget request. Uh, the procedure is uh, long. Uh, it, all the hearings are held in the uh, executive session. We usually start with the Secretary of Defense, although this year the committee felt that because of important uh, intelligence information, we should have the head of the Central Intelligence Agency. But the principal opening witness is the Secretary of Defense, and this year it was Mr. McNamara. I have in my hand here, Bob, his uh, prepared statement, which uh, he has read to the committee, and for five days now we have been interrogating him four to five hours a day. It's 170-some pages, in length, it has about uh, 20 pages of very detailed, highly classified or secret charts. This is the program of some $52 billion for the next fiscal year, which starts in July of uh, 1963. Well, Jerry, a, a, a general question I think to start off with. Uh, in your judgment, uh, are we adequately providing for a, a defense against the communist threat that we have today in the world? Bob, uh, Secretary McNamara has been asked that question in the committee, and he said without hesitation or qualification that the United States military forces are fully adequate to destroy the Soviet Union. Even if we were hit by an initial or first strike by the Soviet Union, the Secretary of Defense has also said that our conventional forces are adequate uh, to meet the challenge of communism worldwide. May I add this point, however, that each of our secretaries of defense uh, under the Eisenhower administration, as well as Secretary McNamara, have said the same thing, that the United States, its military forces, are fully adequate to protect the United States and our vital interests worldwide. Well, Jerry, let me uh, ask this question, which I think uh, might come to the mind of people viewing this program. If we have the power, uh, the nuclear uh, power and other power, to destroy the Soviet Union, uh, why can't we stop? I mean, uh, why do we have to uh, have the power to destroy them twice or three times? Uh, well, Bob, uh, when you're dealing uh, with uh, a closed society such as that exi exists behind the Iron Curtain, you have to have more or less of an extra power, a military strength, uh, so that your calculations are certain and positive that our uh, nuclear striking force is fully adequate to uh, deter the Soviet Union and destroy any potential enemy if they should threaten our security. Uh, one of the things that uh, often comes to the minds of people 
uh, and I think it's a very legitimate question. Uh, in the past, you've heard about the so-called missile gap. You've heard about the so-called bomber gap uh, uh, four or five years ago. These gaps, honestly and actually, never existed. Uh, these uh, allegations, these charges, were, I think, politically inspired to a very substantial degree. It was interesting how soon after the uh, 60 campaign was over uh, that the missile gap disappeared. I think most Americans uh, uh, noticed right away that suddenly there was no more, no missile gap, even though nothing could have been done in that short period of time. That's right. Uh, I must say that uh, some of our people in political life, primarily, made these serious charges, uh, not knowing all the facts. And when they became acquainted with the intelligence reports, and when they became fully knowledgeable as to our tremendous striking forces, uh, then uh, some of the charges that had been made previously uh, during the heat of the political campaign evaporated in thin air. I would, however, Bob, at this point, like to raise a question uh, that I think is as serious today as anyone we face. And this is what I can honestly say is a strategy gap. Many of our uh, military leaders over the past, in fact, I would say all of our military leaders in the past have always said that what we needed to make certain our national security is uh, a mixed force concept for our strategic retaliatory forces. By this, they meant that we had to have man bombers, we had to have missiles, we had to have a mix. We never were going to put all of our weapon systems into one basket. We were going to have a mixed variety of forces. This would confuse the enemy this would make him spend a substantial amount more in defense uh, for his country. And let me illustrate what I mean, Bob. And this shows how science and technology have, have uh, taken over our total defense program. Back in 1958, 100% uh, of our long-range nuclear striking forces were in the manned bomber category. B-52s, uh, B-47, they were very potent and they then had a fully adequate force to destroy the Soviet Union. Now come 1960 with ballistic missiles entering into our inventory, the Atlas and the Thor, we've been working on them for four or five years, about 10% of our total striking force was in the uh, uh, missile category and about 90% in manned bombers. Now come to 1969. I'm not <laughs> quoting specific figures, I'm only giving illustrative figures, but you see by 1969 uh, almost all of our total strategic striking forces could be in the category of missiles with 5% manned bombers. Now as we go down the line and prepare for the defense of the country. I think we are getting ourselves into an, a rather difficult position. I don't say we should have uh, a tremendously expanded manned bomber force, but we ought to have uh, sufficient bombers, sufficiently good operational bombers, so that it makes the enemy uh, build defenses for that kind of a striking force as well as for missiles. And then in addition, I feel that we've got to have a space capability for our retaliatory striking forces. In other words, you can't put all of your striking forces in the missile basket. You've got to have some capability in high performance manned aircraft and you have to have some uh, striking capability in space so that you have a mixed force. This makes it much more difficult for the enemy. Jerry, I think this uh, in part answers my earlier question about why we can't just stand still. I mean, under some conditions, we undoubtedly have the power to destroy the Soviet Union. But if we put all of our eggs in one basket, 
uh, we'd be taking risks, and what we what you're advocating is a mixed force with so that we'd uh, be able to cover different alternatives and possibilities. Is that the... That is correct. Yeah, and yeah. involved in this, Bob, is uh, the problem of the Skybolt and the RS-70 and all of these uh, very, very important issues. What were the implications of the cancellation of Skybolt, which we heard so much about and that affected our relationship with England? Well, Bob, the Skybolt is a... And here's a model of it on a uh, hauler is a ballistic missile to be fired from a B-52 uh, to the surface with a range in the magnitude of about 1,000 miles. This is a ballistic missile fired from an aircraft. Now, the Air Force thinks this is vitally important for the extension of the operational capability of their B-52s. The Air Force says if we have Skybolt on the B-52, we can extend the operational lifetime of the B-52 at least four to five years. And we have an investment now of about oh, seven or eight uh, billion dollars in B-52s, and it would cost another billion and a half to develop the Skybolt. By canceling Skybolt, we hurry up this process of going from a mixed force uh, to a force predicated primarily on missiles. So then you uh, didn't ag or don't agree with the decision of the uh, administration to cancel the development of Skybolt, I take it. Bob, I haven't finally made up my mind because we're in the process right now of getting all the details and I will uh, wait final judgment. I do feel very strongly that we ought to keep some kind of a manned aircraft program so that the enemy's defenses are made much more difficult. Well, Jerry, before our time runs out, uh, I think that I would like to ask you, and I know our viewers would like to have me ask you, about the Cuban situation. Now, earlier we talked about uh, the charges of missile gap in the 1960 campaign, and uh, we are now hearing uh, charges that the, uh, the concern expressed about Cuba on the part of some Republicans is political only. Uh, I wonder if you have some comments. You've been sitting in on hearings of the Defense Department, listening to experts, and I know that some of your testimony, or a good deal of it, probably has uh, revolved around Cuba, so I wonder if you'd comment on that. Bob, uh, our committee has heard uh, tremendous amounts of testimony on Cuba. I would like to summarize it this way. I am absolutely convinced that the administration prior to October 14th, did two things. One, they failed to exploit all of the possible opportunities they had to find out whether missiles were in Cuba. Uh, I say from September 5th of 1962 to October 14th, the administration didn't fully exploit all of the information they had. They didn't use all of the possibilities they had for finding out what the uh, military strength of the Soviet Union was in Cuba. Secondly, the administration failed to keep the American people fully informed on what the military potential of the Russians was in Cuba. Now what worries me, and this is most important, I'm afraid the administration is trying to uh, underestimate again the military potential in Cuba, and this is very serious. Well, Jerry, unfortunately, our time has run out. We, I wish we could talk 15 minutes about this one subject. But we'll be back again in two weeks with another program. Thank you, and good afternoon.